Welcome to my world, bitch. Never grow old, Michael. The blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. Showdown. Hey, what's going on, guys? This is David here over at Sinister Scripts. Hey, guys, it's Ryan. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, so today we are going to talk about the 1987 movie Near Dark. That's correct. This one is uh, directed by Catherine Bigelow, starring Lance Hendrickson as Jesse, Bill Paxton as Severin, Jeanette Goldstein as Diamondback, and Jenny Wright, who is the young girl May. All right. Yeah, I got a bunch of the aliens cast in this one. Exactly, which is kind of funny because, remember, Catherine Bigelow ended up marrying James Cameron. That's right. A couple years after this, I think. Yeah, but that phone call started at all, the one where she called to ask if they could uh, come on board with her movie. Exactly. You know, I I, I watched that, too, in the same uh, documentary that was like after the DVD, and then I read somewhere else that James Cameron was actually the one who encouraged her to use the Aliens cast. So I'm curious which one huh. of them was right, which really? one of them was yeah. telling the truth. Because, yeah, she was like, oh, I casted them and realized they'd worked together on Aliens and then was like, hey, James, this is cool. And then, uh, yeah, I guess James was like, no, I gave her the idea. So right. Whatever. <clears throat> yeah, they so. both wanted it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, but look, looks like the budget was $5 million for this, 1987, $5 million bucks. Yeah, that's a... Uh... It's a, a decent amount, I guess, for back then. This is exactly. And this was Catherine Bigelow's first yeah. directorial debut, right? That is true. Okay. Which is kind of cool. So and and they gave her like an ultimatum, right? Yeah, the guy said he gave her what, three days yeah. to impress him or she'd be out. <laughs> yeah, he's like, if you don't know what you what the hell you're doing, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring someone else who does. So yeah. obviously it all worked out from there. So Yeah, needless to say she performed in three days. Exactly. So real quick before we get started, what just let's go through and do like a uh, like kind of what are your thoughts on the film overall? Just start at the beginning. We'll go through in more detail, kind of a scene by scene kind of thing, mm-hmm. but what, I just want to get your thoughts on it overall. I uh I mean it's been since before we watched it the other night. Uh, it's probably been 10 plus years since I saw it Same. the first time mm-hmm. and, uh, it still holds up, man. I was, I was loving it throughout the entire movie. I thought it was just great. Like great vampire movie. I agree. I thought it had like, I started noticing things kind of, I went back and watched it again cause I was just like, okay, let's put on some headphones and like really dive in like to the mm-hmm. dialogue. Cause I feel like those, like you said, the, all those old movies we start watching, I'm like, man, the audio sucks in these. I'm like having yeah. to crank it up to like 50 just to hear the dialogue. Yeah, We I'm, had it turned up high on that. <laughs> yeah. So I went back and watched it again and like, I felt like it was, was a very like, like it was, it was, it reminded me of the Rob Zombie. What's the one? Uh, not, not the house of a thousand corpses. The second one. Oh, uh, devil's rejects. Devil's rejects yeah. It kind of had that vibe to it where it's like this, crazy family kind of just like flying through the countryside like kind of murdering kinda people like constantly on the run right like a bonnie and clyde yep. thing going on where it's and, and it's and it was cool because uh, you know i they it, this is more of like a a horror western right with vampires mm-hmm. but i thought thought it was interesting that they never once i don't think mentioned the word vampire no they didn't that's through the whole movie this movie's known for that yeah like that's cool like they kind of have the idea of like we know it's vampires we we all can see that but they didn't really like subscribe to a lot of the tropes that most most vampires at the vampire movies at this time had which i thought was yeah. a fun take on it is different well i know she said Catherine bigelow said that uh they took inspiration from dracula but they took all like the gothic stuff out of it Right. And like a lot of the stuff too, like, you know, steaks to the heart, you know, garlic, all that kind of stuff that everybody knows. So right. it was basically just sunlight was like their only enemy. Right. Yep. That so, they brought. So yeah, overall, I kind of, I'm kind of with you. I really liked, it was a unique take. It was a different take on a, it was kind of, and it kind of had some like r- definitely romantic undertones to mm-hmm. this, which I think they pulled from Bracula, Bracula, Dracula <laughs> and his brides. Trying yeah. to combine, combine the words there. So. All right, well, let's get into the movie a little bit. So mm-hmm. let's start with the kind of, we'll do the first part, which is, you know, we were introduced to this character, Caleb Colton, um, who is a young man in a rural town, kind of a ca- young cowboy, Yeehaw. and he sees <laughs> a mysterious woman coming through town, you know, eating an ice cream cone. And he, of course, like young men do, they fight over 
who's going to go hit on her, basically. Oh, yeah, because he was him and his two friends hanging out, and they, they all noticed her, and they're like, ooh, look at that girl eating that ice cream. Exactly. It's like in the, outside of their pickup truck at the Piggly Wiggly. Like, <laughs> yeah. So they, so he get, he wins, I guess, and he goes and he starts hitting on her, which I thought kind of struck me like he was very aggressive. He was super aggressive. Like within minutes of meeting this girl, he's like trying to kiss on her neck and being all like, this. It was I felt uncomfortable yeah. by his aggressiveness. <laughs> and like, was she looking for a ride anywhere, or was he basically like, get in my truck, we're going for a ride? Exactly. <laughs> like she's just like standing outside this the convenience store, like eating an ice cream cone, and he's like. Yeah, hey, young thing. Yeah, hey, baby. It's, it was it was very awkward. So anyway, so they this kind of interaction at the beginning, I thought set the scene set the scene for the central like romance of the story, which mm-hmm. was always there, but also never overshadowed the entire film, which I liked. I'm glad they didn't make this into like an unneeded love story. Yeah. Like it was there, but it was kind of a subplot of the whole idea of the film, which I think the whole idea of the film to me at least was like this idea of family which yeah. i think they talked about several times in the in the documentary, in the documentary did, like yeah. the idea that this is a nuclear family and that all became these vampires throughout different points in their life mm-hmm. and we'll get to that a little bit more so so yeah so she gets in uh, may gets in caleb's truck and they go on a little nighttime stroll and you know start making out and kissing and she bites him which turns him into a vampire. Yep. And they did not, you know, they didn't drag it out. It was pretty much he's bitten. Now he's starting to yeah, feel a little weird. Yeah, immediately starts turning, yeah. Yep, and she's like, you have to get me home, but, you know, before sunlight, and she starts kind of freaking out. And, you know, this kind of sets on this collision course between the nomadic vampire family and his human family, we'll say, which is yeah. his dad and his little sister. Yep. Yeah, because he came running home and immediately started, you know, smoking and almost about to burst into flames because of it. And exactly. That's when the van pulls up and they just they, <laughs> they pulled him the old, van right, pulled an old school and just you know <laughs> roped style. the dude, yeah, roped him, threw him in there. So that's kind of that's we'll we'll stop there as far as like our first set of scenes. You know, we've got the introduction to the main character, uh, Colton and May, and then we've got the the turn, the vampire turn. So. I think, you know, so far this set of scenes, I really enjoyed the idea. Like, first of all, this this, this is almost all shot at night. So yeah. um, everything is, you know, it's all at night. And it was all apparently shot whenever it was like the middle of winter. So it was very cold. Mm-hmm. And they could see their breath was one of the things they mentioned. And they were, what did they say? Like, put ice cubes in your mouth before you talk so that you could you wouldn't see the breath when you were talking, which is interesting. So, right. Yeah, that is interesting. So the, the whole tone for this, this movie was kind of like... You know, the, like the love story, but then also let's kind of have this vampire flick be a Western, but not be a vampire flick. They wanted to kind of stay away from that. But so far, we've kind of gotten our introduction to our main characters. And now we are about to meet the nomadic vampire the family. Group. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. So the David just mentioned, he got pulled into the, uh, like a Heisenberg style <laughs> yeah, van. RV van out in the middle of the, uh, yeah, I think it was a, a Winnebago, I think maybe. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and his dad, his dad and his sister saw him get taken. And so they call the cops. So now is at the point where we meet the family. So Caleb meets the, the vampire family, which is Jesse, which is Lance Hendrickson. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Diamondback, as I mentioned, is Jeanette, uh, played by Jeanette Goldstein and Severin who is played by Bill Paxton. And there's also Homer, which is the little kid, the which little I kid, think that yeah. character kind of sucks. Yeah, um, <laughs> like, I like the concept of it, but yeah. he just... Yeah, I could have done without his character. He just didn't really pull it off for me in that movie. I agree, I agree. But needless to say, here we are. So Caleb is forced to join them as they travel across the Southwest, basically preying on... Humans. Humans, mm-hmm. as, as a vampire would. Um, so the, the, there starts to be a little bit of this uh, kind of tug and pull relationship between Severin, who is kind of the I don't know I kind of, I, I know Jesse's definitely the the patriarch he's definitely yeah. like the father figure but he's, Severin's kind of the loose cannon yeah he's very loose very loose in this game in this movie he's 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 just he's a psychopath he want, immediately wants to kill Caleb and um you know May objects and so they basically uh Jesse says he's got you know 3 days so give him 3 days yeah, to prove that to he can be one of us initiate him into the gang so exactly and it kind of led me to believe that he that this has happened before and they were very tentative to bring someone yeah, else in they, they, yeah they it almost, endangers them yeah it uh, exposes them even more so they <clears throat> don't really want to bring in a whole lot of new people to their group yep so they basically he's given three days he's got to make his first kill as they say uh he has several chances and he's just he can't bring himself colton can't bring himself nope to uh sorry colton caleb colton caleb can't bring himself to make 
uh, his first kill. Hey. So he's feeding off of May um, to keep him alive, basically. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, which I think she mentions at one point, you can't keep doing this because it'll, it'll kill me. It'll kill her, yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of where we're going, where he's he's having a hard time, become, you know, accepting his fate as um, the vampire. And so he, you know, he leaves. He doesn't want to be part of it. He walks through town, you know, tries to get a bus bus ticket home, like yep. the whole thing. Like he's, you know, he even has a cop who kind of gets in his face and is like, what's the matter with you, boy? You on drugs? Roger Predactor. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so he's like, you on drugs, boy? He's like, I'm three bucks short. And a cop gives him $3 to get out of town. Just, yep. you know, you can, it is a little bit, which I feel like they probably would just arrest you now but now they would for exactly sure. <laughs> not, um, not an 87 apparently exactly but one of the cool scenes that i think you pointed out when we were watching it is as caleb is like stumbling through town like oh, yeah. needing to feed he walks by a theater and, and what is on the marquee playing in the background <laughs> aliens aliens which was kind of a, a, a cool nod to you know james cameron obviously Catherine bigelow you know uh, yeah, at the time being a uh, a professional friend of his and later you know they got married so that was kind of a cool little throwback to it um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so he, you know, tries to get out, tries to get away from it, but he keeps kind of getting roped back in with the nomadic vampire yeah, crowd. Exactly. Yeah. They keep taking them back and stuff. And yep. I like how they showed like with them driving around, like each one of them, you know, finding somebody to feed on that night. Like mm-hmm. Homer was pretending like he fell off his bike and was hurt. Yep. Somebody good Samaritan or good Samaritan comes over and gets killed and then, uh, Bill Paxton gets picked up by those two girls very easily. Thirsty, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very thirsty. They're like, "Oh, hey, country boy, you want to go to the bar? Have show us a good time." And he was like, "Yeah, sure." Yep. <laughs> yeah, with his like, what is it? What are those things called? He had his like white shirt with his little like. Is it the bolo tie? Yeah. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so they yeah. call it which cracked me up because bill paxton is just a goofy ass like guy like mm-hmm. i was sorry excuse me was a goofy ass guy but i love the character that he created of just being like he was just unhinged i think he had a lot of fun with this movie you could tell yeah how much he put into this character that he loved doing it and i loved like the behind the scenes stuff with him and lance where they would like stay in like so they're shooting at night mm-hmm. and they would get done and they would stay in makeup and prosthetics and like drive around town and like just fuck with people yeah like the, the poor guy like the train scene where there's like the i forget which it's early in the movie uh there's a train scene uh that, where they're at a train yard and it, this train would come in what at like two o'clock every morning mm-hmm. and it was they were filming the end of the movie um when bill is in some pretty gnarly makeup like oh after blood. he gets hit by the truck yeah and yeah. so he's like hey watch this and he goes up to the train conductor and he's like hey man there's been an accident i need help he said the guy almost fainted. So, like, yeah, absolutely. Having yeah. fun with him, you know, so. And he was I, like, you should see the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like, Bill Paxton, like, he was a real one, so. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, so we're at the point now where, you know, he's having a hard time with this vampire family. And now probably is where we come to the most famous scene in the whole mm-hmm. movie, which is the bar scene. The bar scene, yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah, so this is probably the most iconic scene in the movie where the vampire family, they attack a bar um, which is brutal and bloody, and this this scene kind of highlights the violent nature of these vampires. And kind of this is where I thought it was very much like Devil's Rejects, where yeah, there was just they kind of <clears throat> stroll in, and it's it's super funny. Bill Paxton's like, you know, what kind of donkey piss you serving in this shithole? Like, you know, yeah, I mean? he like, was just, just yeah. a roadside attraction bar that they go into, and the the whole scene where he what was it uh lance henderson orders a, a beer and a glass and he's like you can keep the beer just give me the glass just give me the glass yeah right before they kill the waitress yeah and then uh, diamondback stands up and slits her throat <laughs> and bends her over the table and he holds the glass and he's just catching her blood yeah. yeah so like that starts it and my whole thing with this whole scene is like as that all these things are happening, there are other like patrons in the bar just staring there, where like watching it, being like right. horrified. Right, but I also thought it was kind of cool because it's like they're all in shock. I don't know what yeah. I would do if I was in a bar and like, hey, this lady gets her throat slit, and I would just, I mean, would I just kind of like Homer Simpson into the bushes? Like, yeah, kind of like <laughs> out through Slide a back door right window. But they're just kind of hanging out, watching this all this stuff happen. Maybe they're in shock, but yeah. Well, Bill Paxton, like the whole time he was there, he kept fucking with. The uh, the one guy who was mm-hmm. ordering a drink, he kept stealing his drink. Like he was almost trying to pick fights with everybody. Exactly, he was kind of taunting them and challenging them to do something. I think because maybe maybe he gets bored. Because yeah, he just loves chaos. Well, you're like a super superhero. You're like have all this superhuman strength. So you're just like, hey, let me mess with people because because I can can't die. Yeah, and then uh, well, he was also trying to help. Uh, 
the other guy was it Caleb. Caleb. Caleb, yeah, because like you know he, he pushes the dude or spits a drink in his face, something, and then he holds Caleb up in between him. He's like, "Come on, hit him, hit him," because he's yeah. trying to get this guy. Like, "Come on, you need to feed. If you mm-hmm. want to be with us, you've got to feed." So yeah. he gets punched, and then of course doesn't do anything. So then Bill, you know, Bill Paxson does that cool move where he stands up on the bar and he's got the spurs on his boots and he's just cutting up the bartender. Yes, <laughs> yeah, slits his throat with the spurs. Yeah, that was amazing. I loved it. Yeah, but then finally, what was it? Didn't Caleb actually did punch him and he was like, he knocks him across the bar and he was like, oh, I yeah, do that? that's when he, he like, like folded up like an accordion when he hit that. Exactly. <laughs> pool and table. I think that was the first time Caleb realized like the strength and the power um, that he had now like yeah. he's kind of accepting that and, and so, i think he kind of enjoyed it a little bit exactly so full full-on chaos ensues in this bar so he kills the bartender and then there's the uh there's the the other guy by the jukebox yeah the, well yeah there was the one guy who ended up being like oh crap and then like jumps out of a window because he knew he was gonna die next because he was the last exactly one left in the bar and he was like nope <laughs> yeah but then they chase him down yeah. And Caleb was supposed to have killed him. Caleb lets him go, though. Yep. So that's kind of where we end with this bar scene. So the bar scene's a lot of fun with Bill Paxton, just like I said, pushing people and his iconic lines and just being mm, just yes. kind of a psycho. But you d- finally were able to dis- see on display this violent nature of this vampire family, which I think was kind of, you know, at the time, we didn't get a whole lot of, like, brutal graphic scenes like this. So right. it was definitely, like up there when it comes to the, the level of chaos that this family is causing. So they destroy this bar, the bar, they light it on fire, it burns to the ground yep. and Torched. they head to a, a freaking pay by the hour motel kind of thing, which yeah. is like, but it's not connected. Did you notice that? It's like a, like a little bungalows. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I remember, uh, yeah, when Lance was trying to get the room, the guy was like, haven't I seen you around here before? Right. And Lance is like, yeah, it's probably been about 50 years or something like that since his last stop. And mm-hmm. he's basically like, just shut the fuck up and give me a key kind of thing. And, yep. And I don't know, like, did the motel owner, like, end up calling the police or was it just the guy who ran off? It was the guy who ran off. Okay. Yep. So that, that, that kind of brings us to our next, uh, you know, set of scenes where they're in this this little ho- motel, hotel, whatever you want to call it. What is it? Is it hotel? Uh, doors hotel, on the outside? Doors on the inside? Yeah. Something, something like that. Hotel, motel, holiday, in. holiday in. Yeah, yeah. So they're at this little bungalow and they're playing cards. And just it, this is this is the scene that really hit me also for Devil's Rejects, where I was like, okay, they're at this like shitty hotel playing cards, goofing off, and they're all and they're covered in blood. And they just like they, like like this is what they do, mm-hmm. right? There's no, and I love the simplicity of the scene because there's no social media, nobody's on their phones. They're playing cards, like yeah, just you hanging know, out with each other, right? And you start to you know kind of see just. They've been doing this a long time. This is kind of, they've got their, you know, I like the idea that they have everything down to a T where they avoid authorities. You know, they're switching vehicles and mm-hmm. they put tinfoil on the windows and, and spray, spray paint. paint. And exactly. So, like, they have this whole, this whole, you know, system down pat. Exactly. Um, so now we're at the point where when they're at the hotel, uh, Homer, the, the the boy, who is actually a man trapped in a boy's body, as he explained, because he's mm-hmm. hundreds of years old, right? But he's yeah. he got turned as a kid. So he turned as a kid, yeah, exactly. So he's outside smoking, and he sees a little girl around his age. Well, actually, right? no. There's uh, that's the second hotel they go to. The first okay. one was the one where the cops show up. Okay. <clears throat> and start, you know, shooting up the place and, you know, they're shooting back. You're right. Meanwhile, like all the uh, bullet holes are causing sunlight to, cave, you know, come through mm-hmm. and burning them and stuff like that. And Which, which, which kind of, did you have a hard time with the like, so the guy gets away and it's like, hey, these people killed everyone, burned down this bar. Okay. Mm-hmm. So like 40 cops show up in like this run down town with like semi-automatic oh my, yeah, weapons the, and like the sniper rifles. Had, like, yeah, one had a sniper rifle. I was like, oh shit, okay. <laughs> yeah, like I felt like it was, a, I mean, I understand like they're trying to kind of explain the seriousness of the scene like, you yeah. know, and, and have like a cool exchange of like gunfire, which I thought was very like, okay, corral, like oh, God, Western yes. style. I loved it. I thought it was great. But at the same time, I was like, really? These cops showed up like looking for... Looking for a fight, something. So yeah, so they're as you said, they're shooting holes in the building, and I thought I thought the rays of sunlight coming through and burst and burning them immediately was cool. Mm-hmm. I did like during this movie how the sunlight impacted them quickly. Oh god, they got like charred. Yes, like <laughs> and as soon as it hit them, they're burning up. And then I thought the makeup was really cool. They did a great job with the effects. Yes, on, they did. On, yeah. the, on the skin, and I liked how they didn't really explain the regeneration, but you kind of just got it right. Like they'd be injured yeah. and then, and then they they'd be feed, fine. 
and then they would like, oh, look, like they're not as bad. They, yeah, they, they've been because they've uh, yeah, because at that point, um, they're all like, we got to get out of here. So like, you know, I think Caleb volunteers to go get the van. Yep. And so he's running out there. He's got a blanket. He's even covered with a blanket and still burst into flames. Flames coming off. His hand is on fire as he's opening the door. And so, like, he, you know, gets in the van, busts through the side of the motel. They all jump in. They're all like, yeah, we got away. And, like, at that point, they're all like, you're one of us, you know, basically. You mm-hmm. know, you, you stuck your neck out for us. You know, we that's not going to go unnoticed kind of shit. Exactly. So. so then there's the RV attack, right, after that. Yeah. Yeah. So they do. So they, yeah, they ambush a, a group of travelers in an RV. They, there's another another bloody confrontation, mm-hmm. and Caleb is kind of forced to confront the reality of what he is now. Like yeah, who he is, and he actually participates in the violence. So we're kind of seeing him transition into like he understands who he is, as, and he's part of this family now. Yeah, and I think that's where it's where where we get, kind of get to the the turning point in the story. Where that's this is what your part I was thinking was earlier, right? With Homer when he finds the little girl, right? Yeah, that's so what this, I meant. during this whole time, Caleb's dad and sister are out looking for him. They're trying to yep. find him, and they end up at the same little like I Co- guess, motel, motel or whatever um, that, that, they that the that Caleb is at with the vampire family. And Homer takes the little girl and is like, you know, back to the room. And then, long story short, the dad comes in there and then Caleb realizes this is my sister and my yep. dad. And so now we're kind of seeing this, this conflicted uh, storyline between he still wants to protect his dad and his sister because they are his family, but then also you he's, know, he's part of this, this vampire family. Exactly. So this is kind of like what I call his redemption arc where mm-hmm. he decides, you know, to uh, confront the vampire family, you know, and he's, decides to leave basically yeah is what it boils down to so he leaves with his dad and something kind of happens that i wasn't expecting in this movie which was like the whole the blood transfusion transfusion so like yeah they i i like the idea because i always thought that like growing up watching vampire movies i'm like oh why don't they just like do it like you know change their blood out Mm -hmm. but this one definitely embraced the idea of like it being something about something in your blood that's causing this and if you remove it and you remove the yeah, you remove the parasite. Yeah, it's almost like a, yeah, like a parasite or a virus or something like that. But so yeah, so they do a blood his dad, and I like the background on it too because they they use the character of his dad who was like a veterinarian. Yeah. yeah. So like it was like it wasn't like hey just some random dude knows how to do a blood transfusion. <laughs> right. I don't know how to do that. Right. Um. But yeah, it's like you had an aquarium pump. You know. But anyway, no, <laughs> no. But like his dad and gas. Yeah. <laughs> no, his dad did the blood transfusion and Caleb. Was returns free. to normal, so he's out in the sunlight and he's feeling back his normal self. So, we're thinking this is where the movie wind down, winding starts winding down. But you are wrong because in the middle of the night they come, the vampire family comes back and they take his sister, uh, Bunny. Yeah, he called her Bunny, his little sister. So now Caleb is out trying to get his little sister back, and this is where like what we call, I guess, the final confrontation, mm-hmm. right? Where he wants to go back and get his sister, and at the same time, he kind of he wants May too. He wants to, see, yeah, he wants he, her. He wants her because um, yeah. this is where that kind of that love story comes into play, where you know, and May even came back, remember? And like they That's had right, a little. She did. And she's like, "What's wrong with you? You, you, I, you know, you're warm." Yeah. Uh, so she notices that he's not a vampire anymore. <laughs> So um, they basically we have this mega showdown, which is includes. Oh, let's see where we start. I guess we'll start with him. The 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 semi, right? Caleb rides yeah. into town on the horse and gets bucked off the horse, and and then he flags see- down the semi. Yep. And, which thankfully earlier in the movie they were with a guy, like they hitched a ride on a semi, and he you know kind of taught him how to drive one. I like yeah. that little subtlety that they did. I didn't even catch that. You're yeah. right. So it's like then when he, you know, takes it over because, yeah, he's riding on it. And Severin and, shows up. And then Severin shows up. And shoots him. Yeah. Bullseye. Bullseye. Right in the head. Right in the head. And so, the, you know, driver falls out and Caleb's like, well, now I know how to drive a semi. And it was like, well, it made sense. He looked, he saw it earlier. So now he kind of knows what he's doing. Yeah. Because the guy was like, you know, don't, you know, hit both brakes or whatever because it'll jackknife. And that's, you know, once he's, you know, going full blast in the semi, Hits Bill Paxton, and that's where you get like that iconic 
scene or pictures everyone's always seen of how he looks with this whole face like mangled yeah, beyond like recognition his head open yeah like that's where he gets that injury from so he's punching the shit out of the hood ripping wires and then he just jackknifes it and kaboom kaboom there goes severin <laughs> there so, goes severin I, which i thought during that whole scene when like he hits him and he thinks he's dead and then severin climbs up on the front of the yeah, semi the- that was one of the cool scenes of the movie the makeup was great also got one of the most iconic lines in the movie where he's like hey caleb <laughs> buckle your fucking seat belt like <laughs> so, good. so good like bill paxton was just great in this and so yeah so as we mentioned as david mentioned he jackknifes the semi it explodes and now severin who really is the main you know like muscle character to be afraid of he's yeah, gone he's, he's dead gone. now so he's dead now and so now he's trying to um you know get his sister so he kind of shifts his focus to jesse diamondback may like they're all in the car with 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 the, the little girl yeah um so yeah so we kind of you know in the final moments these are caleb and may are the survivors because what happens is how, how did the little girl get out of the car like well like like because they were standing out like they're pointing their gun at caleb right and then the little girl comes out and then made that's right made distracts or she pushes jesse so he misses shooting caleb that's so right it's like right there you're like oh she's choosing him over her vampire yep. family and then yeah that's when they i think they run off and they're um that starts becoming sunlight. Yeah, they're in like this, like a sedan. They're in a sedan and they're like, shit, shit, you know, trying to cover up the windows, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I think that's the point when like they stop the car. Homer gets out because he starts chasing Cause he wants, her. Because he wants the little girl. Because I feel like that was, and that's kind of sad to me because I feel like he wanted like a companion. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, yeah. But obviously, yeah, he. And he burst into flames. KFC. <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm just well done. Like he exploded. Like yeah. I remember watching. I was like, "Wow, they're super f- combustible." Like, yep. Holy but the shit. whole it was like a slow motion chase scene. So you've got uh, Caleb and his sister, and then May is running towards them. Mm-hmm. Homer's chasing after. He, yeah, they're they're all burning, and then they turn the car around. Jesse and Diamondback, and they're trying to come back and get them and they're like you said they're burning because their windows aren't covered yeah they're too focused on getting them versus covering up the car so right so i think home yeah once homer explodes it was kind of an interesting twist on it i thought because you kind of saw you know diamondback and jesse who were kind of the the mother and father of the group yeah the i kind of feel figures. like they they kind of knew it was over i think so too because they kind of yeah. like you saw they were on fire and they kept doing like the the close-ups of their eyes and it's kind of almost like they just accepted that this their fate their fate and they because it had been a long time uh you know coming and so they just yeah they explode the car explodes yeah. and uh and then caleb takes may back to the farm and, and they do the blood transfusion for her too for her. And yep and the two of them kind of you know i guess live, live happily, happily ever, ever after, after. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> So the 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 film kind of you know ends on a bittersweet note. They you know they continue their nomadic existence, um, but the scene, you know, it says the scene along with the others form the backbone of Near Dark. You know, so this is like this is the end. So they're kind of they've changed, but at the same time they're still kind of haunted by the actions of the movie. Like what happened? Yeah, in the movie. What they know they, what happened. They didn't forget. Yeah, and I'm sure with her it's worse because she has killed. So mm-hmm. she's got to live with that for the well, rest and how of her long, life. Yeah, they didn't really address how long she had been a vampire for. Either. Right, yeah, because so, we knew Jesse was since the Civil War. Exactly, you got that fun backstory. And actually, in the documentary, it was I, love, I loved listening to Lance talk about how he created this whole yeah. backstory and character about how his of character how he turned. was... Yeah, he was in the Navy, and the ship was burning, and like how he sewed the he fought for the south and he yeah. sewed the confederate flag into the inside of his jacket and like how he like he had this whole backstory built out and like when he told Catherine bigelow and she was like yes that's awesome yes <laughs> like you exactly and then bill talking about like how lance got those the nail the pr- fingernails the fingernail prosthetics that and was and cool then, and then went home and like broke them off and made them jagged and gnarly because like, his hands looked pretty gnarly right they looked his, his knuckles everything was like they it, it you could tell that he was, you know, that Lance is a method actor to a degree mm-hmm. because he really got into these roles where he's he's becoming that character. And then his, his stories further, um, we can kind of get into a little bit of that. Let's let's do let's do this. Let's do some some trivia. I got some trivia pieces that I found that I thought were interesting. All right. Um, 
Bill Paxton said that, and the driver that gave him the middle finger when he was hitchhiking, mm -hmm. remember he was hitchhiking and someone drove by and flipped him off? Yeah. That was actually James Cameron. Really? Who was on set visiting <laughs> Catherine Bigelow that day. That's awesome. <laughs> so that was kind of a fun one. Um, let's see here. Uh, we talked about the train one already where you messed with them. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, we talked about the aliens uh, playing on the theater. That was one I had listed. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Oh, this was an interesting one. The 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 smoke. Whenever they were smoking, mm -hmm. did you you saw that in the documentary where they said that they had like that contraption that was underneath his shirt that yeah. was filled with real cigars. Oh Jesus! And it had a pump in it, and it would pump cigar smoke. And so when he's walking through the field in the beginning, and he just starts smoking, yeah, it was cigar smoke, which he that said seems I, super dangerous, <laughs> right? Like it's like, hey, I got this contraption strapped to my chest, full of burning cigars with a pump that had tubes he said that came up his sleeves and stuff and yeah. that's what it was cigar smoke huh and he's okay. like after shooting all night he's like you smell really like rancid oh, like bad three-day-old cigar smoke <laughs> i'll bet yeah. and then he said the whole contraption would get hot obviously obviously yeah so i thought that was interesting because you think about like practical effects like now they're just cgi and like you know yeah the, the smoke, smoke or whatever but, like i'm sure he had like a big metal box so it wouldn't catch on fire but yeah it would get hot as shit so exactly um, and then a little bit more talking about Lance. Uh, he, everybody else flew in for the film, and Lance drove. Oh, was this the hitchhiker one? Yeah, yes. like he drove and like <laughs> to get into character of being this like nomadic, like fatherly figure. And like he like, said, he picked up a hitchhiker and basically fucked with him. Tr yeah, tried to scare the shit out of this guy. He's in costume. He's got these nails. He's got the like the weird like long rat tail thing in the with back of his hair and tall. Yeah, covered in tar and like just. And he said he kept like just trying to make this guy uncomfortable. And I, he's like, and at one point he's like, this guy totally thought I was going to cut him into little pieces. And I was yeah. like, well, no shit, dude. Like, but um, I mean, I hope, I hope to this day at least that Hitchhiker knows <laughs> and has an awesome story to tell about Lance Hendrickson. Either that, or he's like, I will never hitchhike, <laughs> or I'll again. never hitchhike again. Yeah, <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> exactly. Um, one thing I thought was interesting: this they shot this film in forty-seven days, and forty of them were night, or shoots. nighttime. Yeah, like it's all shot it. Like they're basically they were. It, and if, I remember it was a, the guy who played uh, Caleb was like, I was perfect for me. I was 20 years old. And so like, oh, yeah. you know, sleeping all day and Super easy partying all night, which is kind of like makes me think of Lost Boys, right? Like, yep. <laughs> you well, know. I mean, it makes perfect sense for a vampire movie and that's their only weakness is sunlight. So, you know, 90% of the movie is at nighttime. So True. Exactly. So you so can they, see them. They did a great job on that. And then one final piece I had, which I thought kind of played back to the point you made earlier when the... The guy at the hotel was like, have I seen you before? And he was mm -hmm. like, oh, it's been a long time. Yeah. Well, whenever they, uh, whenever Severin and Jesse are torching the motorhome, and Severin asks Jeffy, Jesse if he remembers that time that they, in the fire that they started in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Which uh, is assumed that they meant, we're talking about the Great Chicago yep. Fire of 1871 that left more than 100,000 people homeless and destroyed businesses. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of interesting to see, you know, they, they say that it was a cow that kicked over a lantern. That's right. what started it. But it's kind of funny how they used history and played into the fact that maybe it was this vampire family from yeah forever from, ago <laughs> that they started this fire in Chicago. Um, yeah, so it makes it I very like cool. All the little nuances that they did on that one. So that was yeah. just a few fun pieces of trivia that I had. Um, but anyway, let's move into what do you think of the movie? I mean, like I said, like it, it still holds up. It's still a great movie. Um, if I had to get a score out of ten, uh, I'll go like a six and a half. Like okay, great dialogue, great characters. You know, like. Had a lot of good shit to it. And Bill Paxson was phenomenal. Like I said, like he seemed like he dug the shit out of this role and played it as hard as he could. Yep. And I loved it. I agree. I agree. I think, let's see, if I had to do, we're doing a 10 scale. I'll go, I'll go a little bit higher. I'll go seven and a half. I'm I'm a I'm a pansy when it comes to these ratings. I always yeah. try to give them a little higher. Right. Dave's a little more critical. He's like, oh, it's well, good. I'm trying to. I mean, it's hard. To, it's hard to get a ten out of ten, man. It's hard to get a ten out of ten. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. I'll go seven and a half just because this is like right in my freaking wheelhouse. I, you'll I'll say it again and again. I love the '80s and I love the, the Lost Boys is my favorite movie. And which is funny because this that movie and this movie came out six months apart from Did each other. Really? I think this okay. one was in June, and I think. You know, Lost Boys, I think, was later on in the year, gotcha. uh, like October or something. I can't remember exactly, but they were released very close to each other. Obviously, this one did not have the cult following that the Lost Boys did. Yeah, um, which is interesting because I feel like the, the cast overall... Overall, we, we, you would think would put butts in the seats. Exactly, but. but it was different at the time. And, I, and maybe, 
and I'll just like play devil devil's advocate here. Maybe this is a film that kind of set the stage to allow something like the Lost Boys to have so much yeah. success because you get, it is different. I mean, and then also Lost Boys, I feel like is a little more comedy forward. Yeah, like a little more like a little horror more. comedy. We got you know with the Corys and stuff like that, and but, it had the soundtrack. Oh yeah, the soundtrack was amazing. But talking the soundtrack. This one had freaking Tangerine Dream. As yeah, the no, this which was is a good one. It was more of like a synth, like a creepy synth vibe to it, which is super cool. So check out you know Tangerine Dream's soundtrack for this if you're interested in that kind of vibe. But overall, I'll give it a seven and a half out of ten. I really liked it. To your point, I'll just reiterate. I mean, Bill Paxton clearly stole the show. Yeah, I loved Lance Hendrickson. I always will love him. Going back to Pumpkinhead and Aliens and all the other incredible stuff he's been in. Mm-hmm. You know, David and I had the opportunity to meet him at Mad Monster here in Atlanta, like end of October twenty three, and yeah. uh, and he, <clears throat> the fact that he's still acting is incredible. Um, He's, you know, he's in his 80s now, so he's not... It's not all there. But. Not the not as lucid as he was back in the day, but you can totally tell when you talk to him. He's got amazing stories, and he was just a genuinely, you know, awesome human being. And yeah, just, he was. The career he's had is, is pretty pretty incredible, so I'm a big Lance fan. Mm-hmm. And then Jeanette Goldstein, like, she did a great job in this movie. I was a yeah, big I fan of hers. Her, yeah. I like the 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 change, because we got, we got her from Aliens, and we were like, okay, she's this commando 100% marine. 100% badass. Yeah, <laughs> and like in this one, she still is, but she's also, she tries, they they use her as part of their like stick to like attract people because she's like the sex symbol of the group kind of, yeah. which is a, de- a definite. And she said she wanted to go in the documentary for documentary for that, that what was it like a Marilyn Monroe kind mm-hmm. of like with the bleached hair, yeah. but the roots were going out because you haven't had time to re bleach it. To re-bleach it yeah. Um, so I thought the casting was amazing. And for, for Catherine Bigelow's first, you know, directorial debut, I thought she crushed it. Yeah, and, she did a pretty damn good job. And obviously she's had an incredible career since then. She did, was it zero dark 30? She won an Oscar for, uh, What's the one with Jeremy Renner? Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker, yeah. So she's, I mean, she's obviously a very accomplished, but to see this one and kind of see where her roots and where she came from, it's kind of cool that she started with a horror film because, yeah. And and at that time, was uh, the guy that was uh, worked for the studio, didn't he say like the 80s, like they, they took risks back then? Oh, yeah, they did for sure. Like this was a risky film. And it, it, it was like, I don't, I think from a box office standpoint, was not a box office success. No. But, they knew that that didn't matter because at the time, the video stores were like were so popular. Mm-hmm. So they knew that even if it's not popular in theaters, people are going to rent people it. People are going to see it, yeah. And that's kind of what happened with this one. So seven and a half out of ten would be my score. If you're a fan of the Lost Boys, if you like um, a different take on a vampire movie that never even says it's a vampire movie, mm-hmm. it's a more of a horror western that has some cool kills. Like I said, the bar scene. If you do nothing else. Go to YouTube and watch the bar scene. <laughs> Please. It's like, amazing. The bar scene and the ending, though, it's great. So overall, it's definitely worth a watch. Mm-hmm. Um, I highly recommend it. So Absolutely. Love it. Yeah. So <clears throat> we will leave you with those thoughts. Um, be on the lookout for more um, reviews from us. You can find us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Uh, you can listen to our first episode, which is posted already on Cherokee Creek. So if you haven't listened to that, go check that one out. Mm-hmm. We're on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube Music, Overcast, uh, you know, all of the major platforms you can find us and, you know, drop us a line. Let us know if there's something you want us to watch. Um, and do a review know, on, yeah. Exactly. You know, we've got some more episodes coming up that include uh, Malignant, um, The Sadness. We're going to do a review on that one. And then we had a chance to go in theaters and watch <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. Ooh. So uh, we'll be doing that one as well. So be on the lookout for future episodes from us. Thanks for listening and have a good day. Huh? Have a good one.